<laughs> okay, before we talk about your background, let's just chat very briefly about what just happened. <laughs> so I just introduced you to methylene blue, and it's one of the most prominent nootropics and it really it's really effective when it comes to mitochondrial health energy production energy boosting and it also has a byproduct that it dyes your your tongue blue so that's that's exactly what happened right now yeah so basically i just yeah. asked aj before uh, to give me like the best nootropic he has so a nootropic is basically a substance that will enhance your cognitive performance and he just brought me one and i just tried it right before the podcast and <laughs> and now I end up with like blue teeth and a like super blue tongue, which is super funny, but it's actually a really good introduction, I think, for to what we're going to talk about today. Today we have AJ, who is a pro biohacker. I think the, the goal today basically is two parts. The first part is going to be about reprogramming yourself to heal trauma, anxiety and depression. The second part, which is a bit more kind of niche, is how to optimize your brain and your body to have an optimal performance as an entrepreneur or CEO or someone who is basically working under pressure, a lot of pressure. Perfect. And so, so yeah, so thank you so much for doing this, man. Thanks for having me. Look forward to this one very specifically. Why? Because just a bit of background, some massive health issues between 23 and 26 years old that ended up in a lot of issues, anxiety, depression, suicidal thoughts, and all that stuff. Put the link in the description for people who want to hear that story. And basically, I healed myself using something that we call biohacking. And there we go. I met AJ, who basically is actually much more knowledgeable than me in this field. So I was just thinking... We need to sit down and we need to go through all this stuff because this can just help so many people. You know, money solves your money problem, but it's not going to solve any other problem. And right. what happens at the end of the day is a lot of people are in pain and suffering in silence. We don't even realize a lot of our friends, actually. There was now COVID, two years where we're just being locked down and with all this stuff, people got even more affected. It's just so important to talk about this stuff. It's very taboo for a lot of people. And even for those who are really open about it, you don't know what to do. You, right. don't, you don't know where to start. There is so many things. And also you think you can't heal it. And for some reason, and there are so many tools and techniques to, to deal and even heal trauma, anxiety, depression, and all that's really terrible stuff that no one should ever go through. And we'll just go one by one through them today. So, right. And that's the thing. It's just, it's so prominent in today's society that we have to talk about it. You see, when people see me from a get go, it's like, oh, he's this just big dude who works out a lot probably, and then does all this gym stuff. And it's quite the opposite. I do very minimal working out very minimal gym stuff. And the most interest that I have is actually in understanding the human psychology and understanding the hu underlying human biology that is not just about the body, but actually the way we're wired to operate from on the, on the physical, mental, emotional, spiritual level. So that's because we're more than just these meat suits and meat heads you know, that are, are just put on earth to walk through life and kind of just exist. We're very multidimensional and, and ignoring that multidimensionality bites us in the ass quite frankly so yeah i'm excited to unpack quite a few things super excited so can you tell us who you are talk about your background and basically what you do today and talk also about your own stories yeah man everything started very very organically to be honest for me so when i was a kid i suffered a lot from different illnesses i was born prematurely first of all i had a little heart condition and i was told that i'm never going to be able to be physically active again and i just spent between the years of 8 and 13 i believe i spent of those years on antibiotics so my gut microbiome was destroyed my immune system was destroyed i had kidney stones at the age of 13 so it's it's usually an old man's disease and as a 13 year old i was experiencing kidney stones it's it's wild it's just out of this, this world and slowly but surely my dad actually started started realizing that hey, it's, it's, it's not helping. Like something, something has to be done. I was spending months on end in the hospitals in hospital wars with kids that had stage three or four cancer. And I was sharing hospital beds with, with them. And I, I was just, it was implanted in my subconscious that I was sick. And this is, this is going to be for the rest of my life. And my dad actually started 
encouraging me to to move a little bit, to, to just do a little bit of exercise in the morning, and he would take me on runs with him and play soccer and stuff like that. And I started swimming fairly actively, and but it was it still it still my immune system was, was still not it wasn't catching up yet. And when I ultimately turned eighteen and carried that over into my adulthood. It felt. I felt a bit feeble. I felt I was extremely skinny. I was extremely lean, and I felt weak, quite frankly. So I joined the military, interestingly enough, and through the military experience, I hardened myself up a little bit, and then ended up figuring out that hey, I want to do something about this. So I ended up putting on 50 pounds of muscle in six months. So that was my entrance point because I thought, hey, fitness is going to save me because a fitness equals health, I guess. So let's do it. And little did I know that fitness and health are oftentimes really mutually exclusive. So you can be huge, you can be massive, you can look great, but feel like shit on the inside. So that's when it brought me to nutrition. And nutrition was that second step that I discovered. That was ultimately, how do we use food as a fuel and use food as information, not a math equation, because most of us are looking at food as calories and inputs and stuff like that. But it's, you can't just plug it into the calculator and then voila, you know, it just, it just spits out, spits out the, the numbers that are necessary for your body. It's more, way more complex than that. The, the absorption. So bioavailability, how our body actually gets that food into its cells. It's, it's so complicated. And you realize that at the same time, there are foundational principles that allow you to just push that complexity away, stop counting calories and understand, okay, these are the principles of whole foods, how to eat, what's what to avoid. And it's fairly simple mm-hmm. uh, when it comes to the foundations of it. And then I had insomnia. So I, I was in the military, I developed insomnia. And that was, again, it's naturally, if I'm, if something is wrong, I naturally want to solve it. <laughs> that's, that's the way I'm, I'm wired. That's the way, I, the way I operate. So I wanted to figure it out. So insomnia battled that for about six months and then was able to overcome it with, with meditation practice. We can talk about that more, we'll talk about more it. yeah, specifically. Absolutely. Yeah. And then I realized that there is so much more to, to life than, than fitness and nutrition and sleep. And I developed ultimately a six pillar process of, okay, this is what it feel, what it, you need to tap into your peak performance. So that's sleep, stress management, nutrition, movement, environment, and your mental health. And that kind of, I was like, okay, that's, that works. And then what's next? The next, the realization was that emotional regulation is the thing that is weighing us down and that, that we as society, we have been societally hypnotized ultimately that we're then this, this societal hypnosis right now and cultural hypnosis that is coming from our conditioning that we're living the way our parents taught us, our, our society taught us, and they're we put limits onto ourselves, which, which are ultimately, it's like a good analogy would be you find a box and then you put it over your head and then you're just, you're just in the, in the, in the ball, you know, you're just living in that box. And you think that this is, this is your life. Whereas you can stand up, take that box off and kick it. And then you're free, you know? So that's, we understand that freedom, not just comes, it doesn't just come financially and doesn't just come culturally it comes internally it comes comes from here so mm. uh, that's w- when the realization came that next step to that mastery to actually the mastery of being human we talk about so much talk about how to master the finances how to master our career how to master the things that we do but we talk so little when it comes to how to master being fucking human You're because saying. that's what we are <laughs> that's what we are at the end of the day so that was another piece of the equation that are really I really had to figure out and I'm still figuring out I'm, but, but by no means any of these things that I'm going to talk about I'm embodying them I'm mm-hmm. practicing them but by no means I'm perfect at them it's like it's just it's a continuous process and I accepted it that I don't have to be perfect I don't have to just adhere to everything at 100% and I'm always going to be a work in progress and that's actually freeing and that's 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 a really beautiful realization and actually when you accept and get to that point of acceptance of that fact it frees you and lastly the spiritual piece of things so i'm not i was raised as a catholic i really didn't did not like organized religion so that was one of the things that was really taboo for me 
to talk about and I just I was almost anti anti anything religion anti anything spirituality and then realized that I was kind of looking at it completely wrong because right now as we're having this conversation we're having a spiritual experience if we choose to if we're eating we can have a spiritual experience if we're playing sports we can have a spiritual experience it doesn't just mean that you have to meditate and sit on a mat to or go to church mm. to to have a spiritual experience so understanding that we don't have to bucket everything it's like okay so there is physical there is mental there is everything is a spiritual experience so that's that biggest umbrella that is i would say the most expansive and i i see the limitations with science i see the limitations with with other categories but when it comes to spirituality it's never ending and i'm actually excited to dive into the practicality and application of mm-hmm. spirituality and the entrepreneurship in, in today's lives in modern society Amazing. So maybe you want to tell people what you actually do today. Then we'll go directly through a bunch of definitions and practical stuff that we can do to deal with all this stuff. Nice. Yeah. So I call myself a human optimization expert. And because, as I said, we tend to master other areas of life, but we forget to master being human. And what does that actually mean? So that means those four categories, the physical, the mental, the emotional, and the spiritual sides that we get to master. And So physicality, as I mentioned, is broken down into those six pillars of of peak performance. And then we have mental. Mental is pretty straightforward, actually. It is pretty easy when it comes to the mental side of things. The trickier parts are emotional and, and, and spiritual. And I work mainly with executives, entrepreneurs, and mainly high performers who are ambitious human beings who are looking for ways to expand themselves beyond their current limits. And because we get... We get to the point of with a lot of entrepreneurs who get to say to six, seven, eight, nine figures, and then they're thinking, "What's what's next? Mm. What do I do next?" And that's kind of a, a trouble that a lot of people have because they they feel like they capped out. They've been doing the same thing and they don't feel more fulfilled. And fulfillment doesn't come through more money or more anything. Fulfillment is actually actually comes from slowing down reflecting and creating that internal peace again another piece of that that as uh, there's a lot to unpack there but i'm excited to talk about appreciating yeah. the little things in life yeah man absolutely great so we're going to talk about some pretty deep stuff that a lot of people are ashamed right. of or think that they're screwed for life with which mm-hmm. is really which i at some point i even thought i was and i'm, I'm like you i'm the person who is going to there isn't a problem and I'm going to find a solution. But right. when you don't find one for years, at some point you start to think. You start I'm, questioning yourself. It's like, yeah, is, is, is it my me? predicament. Is it, yeah. yeah, is it me? Like, have I, have I become this person? Was I always this person? Then you got maybe your family background. Do mm-hmm. I have a parent with some kind of issue, etc.? And then you, even your friends, basically, who should support you all the time, they see you like that and they even come and at some point they tell you, you know, maybe you're like that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And... And this is so untrue. It's just you living in that box, you choosing to live in that box. And unfortunately, I mean, I grew up in Lithuania. So if people don't know where that is, it's in Eastern Europe. It's a small country. It's about 3 million people. I grew up in a town of 20,000 people. So you can imagine that there was not much growth and expansion there. Mm. Or people who have done, let's say, anything beyond their hometown or maybe their country. So that was that was a gift and a curse at the same time. So... I still at times, you know, feel that are, when, when I'm saying that I'm not perfect, it's, it's so, it's so accurate. It's nowhere close to that because mm-hmm. all those limitations, all those self-limiting beliefs and doubts still come up. It's just, I know how to deal with them. And they, they disappear in a heartbeat as op- oppositely when I was, let's say a decade ago, I just didn't know how to deal with them. I didn't know how to address them directly as, and they were consuming my life. Or maybe you didn't even know you were experiencing them because you were not at that stage of self-awareness yet. Exactly. So we're going to start this first section about reprogramming yourself to heal trauma, depression, anxiety, and all that really bad stuff that no one should live with and no one deserves to live with. I really believe that anyone can really heal this stuff because the problem there is there is a solution. Otherwise, the problem would not even exist. Right. So, So let's start with a few definitions. First one is about the subconscious, which has a huge part in all that stuff. So can you tell us first what the subconscious 
is and kind of how it works mm -hmm. and why sure. it's so important. So we right now, as we're talking and as you're listening to this podcast, you're you're working with your conscious mind. Right now, your conscious mind is engaged. Your prefrontal cortex is is firing, and you're you're storing information into your conscious mind and gathering this information with your conscious mind as well. Your subconscious, on the other hand, is picking up all the little details. Right now, if you're driving, if you're if I don't know, there is there is some pornography playing in the background. You're just you're just looking at that, and your your subconscious mind is picking up those triggers and making making associations, and ultimately looking for shortcuts because our brain is wired to constantly look for shortcuts. So the more information we input into our conscious mind, the more it makes it into our subconscious. So our conscious mind works on the premise of survival of the busiest. The more you load your conscious mind with the things that you you intend to load them with. So for example, you're listening to self-development podcasts, you're working with with coaches, you're enhancing your ability to, to process things. That is going to seep into your subconscious because you're exposed to it all the time. So I find that a lot of people, a lot of entrepreneurs, they become so successful because they have that traumatic response. They have something in their background when they're growing up, something that they want to compensate for. For example, the father that abused them, the the family that has abused them, something was happening in their family for them to say, that's enough. I don't want to, to ever experience this kind of pain. Let me find a solution to become successful and ultimately have a little chip on their shoulder. Hey, I have to prove myself. And that's all happening subconsciously. So that's that would be this elaborate definition of a subconscious mind. So subconscious mind is everything that we don't pick up, but everything that we're exposed to is actually absorbed within our consciousness. So that would be a subconscious mind. Okay, so we talked about kind of successful entrepreneurs and all that stuff. Like, how does this apply to normal people who have some difficult stories in their life, a trauma mm -hmm. or... Again, like bad relationship with parents, how does this impact them? And how can they understand the subconscious based mm -hmm. on their past? Because that's why they might be experiencing or feeling some stuff today. That's a good question. That's a good question. So subconscious mind does not have a timeline. That's the interesting thing about the subconscious. So when we think about the conscious mind, we, we can understand that there is tomorrow, there is the next month, there is the next year, right? From the psychotherapy standpoint, we're looking at three stages of development. We're looking at our wounded child, so that's up to age five or six, as when we're not really conscious, we don't have that consciousness. Then we have the adaptive child, so that's our teenager years. And then we have the functioning adult. So those are three stages of development. And there is no, sometimes when we are behaving, we can actually ask ourselves, who's talking? Who is who is present right now? Am I talking to the functioning adult or am I act or I'm talking to the teenager who's acting up? And as I said, I'm nowhere close to being perfect. I know my I know my teenager is very mean and the way he actually created his defense mechanisms and the character armor around itself to survive was because exactly for that reason. He needed to survive. He started looking for he would constantly look for weaknesses in people to identify weaknesses to identify the shortcomings so he can pinpoint them to make them feel less significant so when my conscious when i'm tired or when I, when i'm not as conscious as i don't want to feel that coming online you see i'm i'm more and more aware of it so, so most people don't even realize what's happening mm -hmm. they're like it's 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 just this overwhelm is like, why am i acting like that why am i acting like a child it's because it's in our subconscious and we're looking to finish the cycle Something that I learned from the Vipassana meditation and the Buddha said that every phenomenon um, that is completed from the beginning till till end, I might be butchering the quote, by the way, every phenomenon that completes itself from beginning till end becomes empty and produces wisdom. So what does that mean? I usually look at, at that as a cycle, as a degree, just just circle. So our subconscious is looking for example we were traumatized when we were five five years old five years old by our by our father we were beaten mm. let's say and our subconscious is creating a certain defense mechanism that right now we're repeating that defense mechanism as adults so we're about let's say three quarters in into that cycle trying to close that loop and then we we can't close it because we're we're not aware we, we can't we're not able to go past it so then we go 
back to those three quarter of the way in three quarter of the way in we're not able to close that cycle because we're not consciously addressing it we're not understanding what's happening in the background it's mm-hmm. like why is that behavior repeating itself is because our subconscious is looking to close that traumatic loop and that's where meditation breath work and other modalities that we're going to talk about come in handy where you're able to turn off your conscious mind at that time and actually finish the process that that has been started so we kind of went long in, th- in the tooth with this one but that's that would be I've, the understanding i of want that. to go even deeper basically because i think conscious mind is about five percent yeah and subconscious is about 95 percent. correct so basically as a kind of recap if for all your childhood you've been abused this all happened in your conscious mind because it's, it's what you process basically right. and this is this has been repeated and repeated and because it's been repeated it went into your subconscious and all sure. the mechanism to react to that has been integrated in your subconscious in a very negative way so it's something that's going to impact you later on because of the repetition of the situation precisely so for example if you're doing something consciously right let's say you're uh, you're exercising every day consciously you're waking up and you're exercising you're doing 100 push-ups so then you're you're naturally uh, this first couple of days it takes you a lot of effort to start doing those 100 push-ups and then you see that it becomes automatic right because so we consciously start the process and then it becomes habitual it becomes unconscious it same thing happens with our emotional expressions so when we repeat certain cycles of of expression some of them might not be conscious at all it would just get into the pattern of of doing the same thing again and again and then it just becomes so habitual that we don't even question it so it's like sometimes uh, you you wouldn't if you are if you have been doing push-ups for a thousand days in a row you don't even wake up thinking about that should i do push-ups i was like i'm gonna do those hundred push-ups because i've been doing that for a thousand days in a row same thing goes with emotions absolutely okay and this is really key because our brain is just trying to find shortcuts exactly. to be back. and so all what we experience in our past basically the good and the bad all our responses that have been repeated are integrated in our subconscious and are the reason we're responding to different situations the way we are today. Yeah, once you're conscious, then it's it's definitely not your fault, but it is your responsibility to rewire and to eradicate it. Because when it comes to learning, there are, I look at learning in three stages, really. At first, we, we're just ignorant, right? So first thing is to actually learn the theory and understand it cognitively. Mm. And then the second stage is to practice it. That's most people just stop at the first yeah. stage. When you think about our educational system, we just have theory and we don't apply it at all. So when it comes to our our schooling system, our universities, all that kind of stuff, it just is not not applicable. So that's where most people stop at that stage one. Stage two would be actually applying that knowledge and going to the field and using that knowledge with actual application. Doing, for example, you learn to facilitate breathwork sessions, as an example, and then instead of just understanding the theory, the nervous system regulation, all that kind of stuff, you go and work with people. And then the third step that goes towards mastery is repeating that and learning from your mistakes and asking other people and professionals in the field to to give you feedback to help you understand things on a deeper level. So that's when you reach mastery, and very few people get into that direction. Yeah, you're looking at fine tuning yourself to get to this master level. And even people who had the kind of almost perfect childhood, no one had the perfect childhood. Right. So there is always going to be some stuff that will explain the way you react to different situations and that you can then go and deepen and try to get better at. Because it's very easy to dismiss all this stuff. It is because I have a very, my patterning, my, my conditioning has brought me up with a very left brain oriented mentality. So I'm very analytical very (laughs) logical and all that kind of stuff right and that kind of it shoots me in the foot because i'm ultimately looking to filter everything through my logical mind and that's as we just talked about it's very limited it only has five percent of the capacity of the whole of the whole human existence so 
interesting when you're listening to these things and you might think oh this is this doesn't apply to me or this is bullshit it's like, no don't say this doesn't apply to me because it's never zero or a hundred there's always a sliding scale somewhere in between it's like how does this apply to me what can i learn from this where can i improve this because this is when we say that this doesn't apply to me there's no room for growth we're already at that fixed mindset that fixed mentality there's nothing to do anymore whereas if we ask that question how can I apply this? Where does that apply in my life? Then we have we, we can work with something because you're you're open, you're no longer closed off. So that's something to to reflect right now. If you're listening and thinking that ah oh, this is uh, whatever, so yeah. challenge yourself. So let's talk about something a bit more precise, which basically is trauma. Mm-hmm. So what is a trauma, and then how can early trauma affect someone in their adult life? Mm-hmm. First of all, I want to start with how can it affect our adult life. So what we just talked about, about the adaptive child and the wounded child and functioning adult. So that's exactly how what happens. It's like we are traumatized as kids and our subconscious does not understand that we're not a kid anymore. We're still, we still have our inner child, the character, the everything that, that he he or she possessed it's still within us it's still inside of us you know it's like when you think about the things that you enjoy doing like dancing painting what have you when you completely lose your mind that's your that's your child at play you know so trauma is ultimately an event or a set of events that is too over overwhelming for our system to to take on so our system is not able to respond to that so it is it ultimately contracts and there is this massive challenging event that, that, that happens on the outside usually, or it is on the outside, but our internal landscape is not able to respond to it correctly. So it gets overwhelmed and that it gets stored within our body. So that, the way I like to think about it is it's ultimately contraction. There is, there is an event and our system is trying to match it, match that event. But if it's not, if it's not capable, it contracts and it protects itself, but it, it keeps that that signature, that flavor within our body. It gets stored. Every single thing that the somatic practices, the spiritual practices talk about is about consciousness. So uh, something that I learned from a mentor, a good friend of mine and a business partner, David Hans Barker, is like that everything is either consciousness or matter. So as we develop our consciousness, we become lighter. The more and more light we, uh, when you get into psychedelic states, apparently I haven't been to that stage yet through meditation, you see human beings as like fibers of light ultimately so you get into you understand that everything is is consciousness and then or matter so if you're if you're more more conscious and you're exercising that muscle of of consciousness and dissolving these complexes so for example that traumatic complex it's your system can be can train itself to to respond to it and to match the level of it for example i I recently got into a motorbike accident and the way my nervous system responded, it was just completely, I didn't freeze. I didn't fight or flight. I didn't have like a trauma response because my system is developed enough to match that event and ultimately overcome it. So my, my system is, is just, it's just not affected by that traumatic response. So another example would be having a surgery. So it's a very invasive practice to have a surgery. It's like, and about, about two years ago now, I, I had this infection that I caught in Thailand and I had to get my finger cut open. And I really don't like hospitals. I, I don't remember last time I, I've been to one for, for something and I just had to get it cut open and they tried to pump me with all kinds of painkillers. Pain mm-hmm. So I said, I politely refused and I asked them to conduct the surgery without any painkillers and i ultimately got into a meditative state and went through through experience of of a surgery while they were picking my finger apart without any any painkillers and any medication and that's again that's a trained response because i've been actually practicing for it and preparing my system for whatever comes when it comes to bodily responses that my body is able to process it so Again, this is not something that happens overnight. This is the repetitions. I, today I logged 1,212 days in a row of meditation. So it, it is definitely not something that happens overnight, but it is a process that is repeatable, that is predictable, and you can actually 
actually understand it really well and understand how to apply it to your life. So that would be that would be on the traumatic responses. What I realized is a lot of people who had some trauma when they were young, it only starts to really show up when they're in their early or mid twenties. Mm-hmm. What's the is there a reason for what was the kind of reason for that or the explanation? Actually my guess would be that we mature and our cognitive processes kind of start settling. So we stop we stop growing and ha- going through that spur of growth and we start consolidating our consciousness, our identity, all of the things like that. So, and also it's because of the accumulation of, of the emotional, of the unprocessed emotions. Everything, I usually look at our, at our tank as humans, our capacity, right? So if you are, if you have like a tank that is, that is like this glass and every time you have some sort of a, an unprocessed emotion, anger, frustration, sadness, you're, you're pouring a bit of tar into it, right? So we could pour a little bit of tar into this glass. And then at some point, the glass starts overfilling itself. Mm-hmm. It's going, going to be overfilled and, and start, start pouring, pouring over. And then we have a choice either to, either to suppress, suppress that with medication. So in the, in the system, it's, we're still pouring, <laughs> pouring that tar into the glass, but then we just disable the senses and kind of create mask the symptoms instead of going to the root cause, which is stop pouring fucking tar in it. You know? mm-hmm. And then by slowly but surely start processing those emotions and the traumatic responses by pouring it out. And this is something that most people are not aware of, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. So that's where anxiety and that's how I would say it's just simply build up. And for some people, they channel their understanding, they channel their energy somewhere else, like work, business, mm. because they're compensating for that. So it's like they're super successful in that one area. And then that's all they focus on. So they don't have to p- feel pain when they're on their own and when they're not doing anything. And ultimately, we're going to have to slow down. We are going to have to be with ourselves, our thoughts, and to deal with that inner critic and actually to shut up our uh, that inner chatter because that's the most powerful thing that's the only time we can actually feel true presence when our inner chatter is not there okay so basically even if you didn't have big trauma in your childhood just because of the way we live today what we eat we don't sleep enough social media notifications everything this is just this is just too much to handle and it just accumulates accumulates Mm -hmm. accumulates until Basically, it's, it becomes too much, and that's when basically start to experience anxiety or depression. Yeah. And actually, talking about anxiety and depression, it's an interesting thing the, the way we define it because a lot of people throw those things around quite a bit. And when you think about it, what is anxiety? It's a it's an abstract concept. It's a it's a construct of the mind that we just found the word for. Ultimately, what is it? A set of sensations within our body. That's all it is. When you think about anxiety right now, if you say that you're anxious and you close your eyes and you ask yourself, right, what, what is it? Where is it in my body? You can very easily identify it. Usually for some people, it's in their chest, in their throat, in their head, maybe in their stomach. And then, okay, you can describe the color of it. You can describe a shape of it. You can describe a size of it. And once you actually have, have that and understand that it's just a set of sensation that sensations that's manifesting within your body it's not an abstract concept anymore you can actually tackle it directly rather Mm -hmm. than saying that you're depressed so depression okay once again it's it's usually this heavy feeling that we feel within our body somewhere and we the reason why we're running away from it because it's unpleasant it's like we want to run away from it we want to hide from it so we take medication uh, to relieve that feeling rather than actually dealing with the feeling itself Mm -hmm. if you if you know that it's like having a monster under your bed, right? As like when you're a kid, right now as an adult, it's just like still being a, being like a kid and and not dealing with a monster that's under your bed. How do you deal with it? You look under the bed and see that monster is not there. Same thing with this. It's just you go straight into your body, identify that set of sensations, ask questions, get curious about it, and be inquisitive about it rather than just suppressing it or running away from it. Okay, awesome. So, is someone who had the trauma in their childhood whether one or basically a repetition of trauma screwed for life absolutely not i had 
besides besides the sicknesses, I mean that was that was quite quite a traumatic experience for a child because you're ultimately seeing other children in the hospitals, see, seeing them die ultimately. And I was like, I, I remember uh, it just one of the one of the flashbacks that I have. I, I don't remember how old I was, like maybe seven or eight years old, when I was in the hospital ward with with this kid who was throwing up blood and few days later he wasn't there anymore and i didn't understand why he wasn't there anymore at the at the time but he he ultimately passed like i i found out a few a few years back a few years later or i would say a few decades later i asked my parents about it and because i had that flashback and and they told me that yeah that kid had stage four cancer and he he died well well they were operating on him so the, that stuff sticks into our subconscious mind. It just it it does get stuck. So, but compared to a lot of people, I, I would say I had a pretty decent childhood, a pretty decent decent upbringing. Even though there was a lot of you know survival, all other kinds of kinds of kinds of things. But for example, I look at my business partner. He grew up in abuse in such rough conditions, and he completely liberated himself from that because. He was able to identify the set of sensations. He was able to take ownership, not only of himself, but of everybody around him, because that's what ultimately is missing. We are put into this, we put ourselves into this victim mindset where we're at effect. So something is happening to us rather than happening for us. And when we're in that state, we are completely out of control and we're a victim. So if you want to not be a victim, Ultimately, you have to take charge. You have to be something else than a victim. And one of the examples that he gave me, that is just, a lot of people talk about extreme ownership, right? And you're probably familiar with the concept mm-hmm. from Jocko Willing. Extreme ownership is ultimately taking radical responsibility for everything and anything that happens in your life and seeing that as you cause that somehow and there's a lesson for you somehow in that in that event. and. So right now as an adult, I understand that concept. And Dave was telling me a story about his childhood and he, he just took it so much further than I, I thought it was possible. He was like, when I was a kid, when I was X years old, I could have actually educated myself and then educated my parents how to parent me better. Mm. So that, that kind of... That, that, that just that just gave me gave me such a such a wave of inspiration of that a person could think so in it could be in such an empowered state you imagine like uh going back and and be feeling compassionate for that whole situation where he was definitely a victim where he was definitely a child who didn't have any tools or anything else to control that situation but then he went back there and said yeah i there was a possibility for me to take charge and it was just it just floored me it's like so no absolutely not it's not you're not screwed for life and there are so many examples not just him not just my example but so many examples that of people that are going through even heavier stuff mm-hmm. and go on the come out on the other side and it's first of all it's a choice because most of us can either choose to be a victim or we can choose to be someone who's creating our destiny. And you can be both. Yeah. That's a catch. And I would go even further than saying it's a choice. Let's say the trauma comes from, from your parents, which mm-hmm. is pretty often the case. Right. Your parents didn't realize that they had an issue and they never worked on it. Right. And because they never worked on it, obviously, probably they didn't even, didn't even realize it. They didn't do the work. Right. Then they had you. And obviously, they passed whatever, on everything. Exactly. <laughs> they passed on whatever issue they had from their own parents who right. never did the work. And so basically, not only it's your choice, but it's your duty before you have kids. And actually, when I was super sick myself, for some reason, the first reflex I had was, I need to heal myself, I need to heal myself, because if I have kids, I'm going to fuck them up. Right. Because I'm fucked up. I don't understand why today to drive a car, you need to do a driving license. Mm. But you don't need to do a kid's license or a kind of multiple exam on are you financially healthy before you have kids? Right. Are you mentally healthy? Are you physical? All that stuff that basically you should be doing it to have your kids so that right. they can be raised mm. by having the least chance of being fucked up and then ha- 
then having all that pain and having to do all that work. And so for people who are listening, no one will ever be perfect. But I think it's really key to just talk to a therapist, try to understand what might have gone wrong, even if I feel great. It's my duty before I have kids. Generational trauma, because it's not, ju- it's not just coming from, from you as a parent. It's coming from generations and generations beforehand. And so because I'm, I'm looking at my parents and yeah. They just they just lived the way their parents lived, and exactly. uh, and the things that they carried through it was it's just ultimately I can I can pinpoint the exact things that my dad did that his dad uh, did, and uh, all these uh, he overcame certain things that he hated about his dad, and he was conscious of them. For example, like he wasn't my dad was, never drank because his dad was an alcoholic, so one of those things that that he suffered from when he was a child, he naturally, naturally, consciously chose not to, not to pass it on. But there's so much more than these surface level, <laughs> level things that we, we talk about. There's, there's so much underneath. And if you feel great, that's, that's good. That's actually a very empowering state to, to do the work, to find things. It, it's not like you have to find things that are wrong about yourself. <laughs> it's just, it's more of a, hey, where can, as, as you said, where can we fine tune it? Where can we actually take it to the next level? Because the levels are, are endless and that's a beautiful thing. It's just when people ask me, how long is it going to take for you to, how, is, how long is it going to take for me to get in shape? How long is it going to take for me to make X amount of money? It's like your whole fucking life. <laughs> Absolutely. So before we get on to practical stuff to deal with all these interest feelings and thoughts, what's happening basically in my body at kind of the biochemistry level when I suffer from anxiety, for example? Mm -hmm. Right. So biochemically, I'm not a huge fan of explaining the things from the, from the biochemical level when it comes to anxiety and depression, because it's more than that. However, for example, adrenaline, like when oh, and 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 cortisol when it's flooding our system. So when we're flooding our system with cortisol, when we're exposed to stress, so cortisol known as a stress hormone, right? And we're we're getting into into that state chronically. That meaning that repetitively, again and again and again, and without modulating our system or ultimately downregulating our system. So cortisol is shooting up so your system is upregulated up you're ultimately in the in the active state to down regulate your system you want to relax and most of us are living our lives in this upregulated state we wake up we grab our phones we are we have a complete an immediate immediate adrenaline and cortisol rush first thing in the morning which is healthy because it's necessary for us to wake up however we get into into this chronic state without balancing ourselves out. We're starting starting the day in the reactive state rather than being in a responsive state. And we go throughout our day and then we, we're we still wired at the end of the day and we're trying to fall asleep. Then we take some pills to actually downregulate us instead of using using our bodies, which are made for for that, and pass out and then keep keep going at this. So biochemically, it's, it's pretty simple. It's like you want to balance out your nervous system and your physical system in a way that it's producing hormones that are necessary to, to be produced at certain certain times of the day. For example, you wake up, you get some sunlight, you spike up your cortisol naturally with the daylight, you do some movement to, to raise your core body temperature to actually move your joints. And then at the end of the day, you're blocking as much as possible of the artificial light that is is still spiking spiking your cortisol and you're down down regulating your system with yoga with breath work with just not using electronics with journaling with reading something something calming and then you go to bed so that should be the way the way it happens but because we don't do that that's how anxiety ultimately manifests and it just it just becomes so crippling that we feel we feel like we need something external for us to soothe it down. But as I said, anxiety, ask yourself, where is it in my body? It's a set of sensations. That's it. Like anxiety is just a concept. So from the practical level, it's a set of sensations. And sometimes when we feel super overwhelmed, it might feel massive and it's like tearing us apart and it's so unpleasant. But that monster, that anxiety is just a monster. When you look at it, when you examine it, when you actually look under the bed, nothing's there. So 
go deeper into it and kind of hone in, make it, make it identify, pinpoint the exact point in your body where that anxiety, where that anxiety lies. In the beginning, it might feel like it's your whole chest, but as you, as you actually become inquisitive and start, start digging, you understand that it's a tiny, tiny fraction of that big sensation that you felt. That's it. Yeah. So for example, you have an abusive parent and they repeatedly, I don't know, scream on you or, or abuse you verbally or physically, yeah. then basically you're going to have what we call this fight or flight response, mm -hmm. which basically at the kind of biochemical level is... Fight, fight for flight or freeze. That's another response. Exactly. Fight, right? fight or freeze, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so this will be repeated in you. And this is going to become a way to react to a danger situation. You're actually Wait. attracting those situations because you, that's so ingrained in you. You're looking for that, for that situation, for that pattern to manifest itself in your, in your real world. So because we have those patterns that are ingrained in us, our bodies, as I was talking about the cycle, right? It's looking to complete itself. It's looking to close the loop. So it's done. It's like, we're, we're done. We are just going for, for example, what you wanted to do as a kid, or then, for example, when, when I was, let's say verbally abused. And when I think about that, I, I just wanted to stand up at that, at that moment because, but I felt powerless because I didn't feel like I could do anything, you know? So that subconsciously, maybe that, that's why, that's why I went to the military because if you, if I go to the military, it's like, no, nobody can fuck with me. It's like if I put on muscle, nobody can fuck with me. Mm. So that's my childhood. Potentially, that was my childhood trauma manifesting in my later later life. And then you identifying those those reactions and responses. I actually just read Will Smith Will Smith's book, and he he was talking about how he was in the boardroom with his executive in Hollywood, and they he was just walking around them and he's in his 60s with back problems and they they they're coming from the environment where everybody was trying to start to fight and was trying to swing at them or or even you know shoot at them they were so their nervous system was so dysregulated that they were constantly looking for for signs to overreact so they they ultimately almost got into a fight with a with an executive in his 60s because <laughs> their nervous system is so attuned to that. So right now, once again, I'm going back to that timeline of wounded child, adaptive child, and functioning adult. Most of us are responding from that wounded child, and it's just this automatic knee-jerk response without us consciously and consciously looking into the pattern itself. So examine the the practical application to that is to actually see where th that manifests in your life right now in this moment where you're you might be reacting as a as a little kid or you might be reacting as as a teenager so because that's why we're adults it's like most of us are actually still a bunch of a bunch of children in the adult bodies and that's the scary thing about this because if we're not conscious of it it's not gonna go anywhere mm. that's why that stuff gets passed on to our children mm. absolutely last maybe thing to define gut health and microbiome why do some people call guts your second brain yeah, because the biochemical processes and the gut, in, the gut diversity and biodiversity in it is so massive that we're just a bunch of bunch of parasites. Ultimately, it's like we are created of the the, the microbiota, the parasites, the of the microbes, and everything else that is living in our guts is ultimately dictating our emotional states. So if you don't have a good biodiversity and your gut health is pretty poor you're ultimately from a biochemical level you're going to going to automatically automatically feel a bit more sluggish a bit more less attuned to your emotions or driven by your gut because when i was when i was talking about being on antibiotics and my immune system being shot mm -hmm. is because exactly of that my gut my gut microbiome was destroyed because antibiotics what they do they ultimately annihilate the biodiversity within our guts and the gut lining and what is called the leaky gut syndrome and that ultimately dictates a lot of immune system responses our our neurochemical and biochemical processes within our body so that's exactly why it's called the second brain. It's, it actually can be our even our first brain because exactly exactly yeah. If it's not if it's not taken care of, 
there's there's not going nowhere from there. <laughs> so it, it is uh, the gut sort of the second brain where some of the actual most important chemicals come from mm-hmm. to be happy. At that. Is it why the reason if your microbiome is destroyed or your guts are not working well, which basically you can see when you go to the toilet, right? And if it's not going well, like most likely it's impacting my my mental health and my physical health because. I can't produce the right chemistry that my entire body needs 100%. to feel better. 100%. So that's, that's why I usually, when I work with people, I usually start from the physical side of things. Because if your physicality, if, you're, if your human body and your human meat suit is not taken care of, we can't really go from there. Because if you're not taking care of your body, then it's naturally going to impact your mental, emotional, and spiritual state. So that's why we have to start with, with the physical side of things. and. Exactly. It's like it dictates where the hormonal production, the way we feel, the way what we crave, what how we behave even. So it is it is one of those things that when it comes to gut health and obviously it's more than food that affects that. Mm. It is it is super, super, super important to take care of. Okay, amazing. So let's jump now into the key part. So of course this is not medical advice. We're gonna talk about a bunch of methods that I've basically used to first cope with my issues that basically you're going to complement right. greatly. Some people are less sensitive to these things. That's the thing. When it comes to food, food stuffs, biochemically, we're all getting impacted in a similar way. But some people are simply, first of all, less sensitive and more likely less aware of that. So there's, there's def- there are definitely some fundamental principles. Because when I think about tactical solutions, they are, they're there to achieve a certain, certain outcome. But when real, real results come from, from from principles like business, from Ray Dalio, if you haven't read Principles, it's an amazing book to read, and it just kind of defines the underlying principles where that form our our ways of thinking. Mm-hmm. So yeah. So to start basically with these tools to cope. So basically, I'll go through what I've done. Uh-huh. The first thing I've done is acupuncture. Mm-hmm. Okay, so. So, uh, which my, I'm very, I'm very sensitive to it. So it works amazingly well. Mm-hmm. I've done acupuncture. I've done Reiki, mm-hmm. basically. So this hand healing stuff. I've right. done therapy. I've done cognitive behavioral therapy, mm-hmm. which is very similar to what you talked about before about basically looking, uh, becoming more self-aware, and which goes hand in hand with meditation, of course. Right. But for well, me, the meditation for me, therapy was was derived from meditation. Yeah. Vipassana meditation is actually the, the foundation of a cognitive behavioral therapy. What's the kind of stuff that you would recommend that you can kind of run to break this negative cycle to get back to feeling decently well? It's not going to solve your issue, right. but it the at main least issue... To minimize it. Exactly. Yeah, at least you don't have to take medication that is only going to suppress the symptom. So you're at least addressing the symptom. I would start with hypnotherapy, actually. Hypnotherapy is one of those modalities that is incredibly powerful to understand the root cause of it as well because they work with the mind not just on the conscious level but they go into the subconscious and our subconscious is very good at taking commands and you're able to really reprogram the way you respond to to certain to certain situations so you're being taken into that situation when you're, when you're hypnotized, when you're, we say, under, and then you're able to reprogram the way you would respond in that exact situation so it's not no longer triggering. If you have some traumatic response, another one that, that is incredibly powerful is EMDR. That's eye movement, desensitiz- eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. It's a mouthful. So EMDR is an amazing modality as well. It's ultimately you doing with a the therapist. He's working with you or she is working with you and you're following their finger movements. And at the same time, you're ultimately processing when our eyes are, are following something and then we're trying to process the memory. Our brain, interestingly enough, kind of short circuits and it can't, can't be triggered anymore. So that would be another modality that I would highly recommend. Another one would be a neuro-linguistic programming. So neuro-linguistic programming practitioners, they're great at solving. I'm a certified NLP practitioner myself. So that's one of the things that is a good fundamental tool to address that top level issue before we dive deeper. What is that? Neuro-linguistic programming ultimately is 
going into your subconscious response as well. So you're, you can actually deal with phobias through neuro-linguistic programming, for example, the fear of spiders, you can actually desensitize a person from them. They, you're able to create space. So we have three ways of processing information. There is generalization, there is deletion, and there is distortion. So we're able to use neuro-linguistic programming to, to go into, into the root cause of whatever is causing anxiety or, or depression, and then you're able to switch your mindset around it so you're creating a different different angle you're you're creating some space between you feeling it and as you're kind of looking looking at it as a as a third person so it's it's a powerful modality yeah okay. so those would be my top three hypnotherapy emdr and nlp another one would be breath work that's an incredibly powerful modality that that you can use a person with a practitioner, a certified breathwork practitioner, that are, they're going to take you through a breathwork session where you're able to release emotions and that overflow of emotions and actually process something that is, that is, it is a coping mechanism as well, I would say. 